into the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and ask a question um, as we're going, feel free to use the raise of the hand um, or just turn on your screen and start waving. <laughs> um, so feel free to engage however feels most comfortable um, as we're going on. And hopefully you should see in the chat the links to a notes document that has all of our resources for this webinar, as well as the slides. The slides are also available on um, our PFF website where you signed up. So either one of those spaces, feel free to download them. That has all the information we're going to cover today. And I think we're going to get started now. Um, I am Jesse Knippel. I am one of the PFF fellows here at Claremont, and I'm hosting with Liz, who is also a PFF fellow. Um, and today's webinar is on um, teaching philosophy statements. So I'm going to now um, share our uh, slides. And as I said, you can... Um, you can see the slides, um, download the slides from the um, website or they should be in the chat as well. And there is a document that you can take notes and write whatever you want based on what we're doing today um, in that. So this is Teaching Philosophy Statements 101. This is a brief overview of the wonderful tool that we call Teaching Philosophy Statement that you will often be asked to um, submit with a job application. So feel, as I said, if you missed it earlier, please feel free to have your camera on or off. Feel free to engage in the conversation as much as you are comfortable or as little as you are comfortable. Utilize the chat function, speaking out, raising your hand function, whatever you feel most comfortable with. And um, we just ask that you are respectful of each other when sharing and respectful of um, myself and our co-host. And we're glad you're here. So let's get started. So today we're going to cover what are the key elements that make up a TPS statement, which is a teaching philosophy statement. What are some of the best practices when writing? And where, when, and how do these get used? So. A teaching philosophy statement is the narrative essay that you use to highlight your teaching beliefs, how you um, embody those beliefs as an educator, and your philosophy around education and what you do and how you do and why you do in the classroom. Um, and we want to articulate that in concrete examples. So. It's philosophy, but it's philosophy that's like connected and rooted to actual action and embodiment um, within the um, within what you're doing in your classroom. And it's a way to give potential employers or students or other people you're working with an idea of who you are and your unique footprint as an educator. Um, so some of the core elements of a teaching philosophy statement are things like, why do you teach? Um, you teach because you're passionate for sharing education or passionate for helping people facilitate thoughts, right? Um, what do you teach? Do you teach the history of um, the computer program Python? Because you think it's really, really important for people to understand how that works and why it came about. Do you teach, you know, I teach the history of witchcraft because I'm a religious studies scholar. So I teach how and why um, what we consider witchcraft has come about and where it's going, things like that. Um, and where do you teach? Are you teaching in a community college? Are you teaching in an academic adjacent institution? Are you teaching at a graduate school like Claremont? Are you teaching at a international school? Um, and then also, how do you measure whether or not what you're doing in the classroom works? What, um, what elements are you using to mark how effective you are as an educator, 
how effective you are in your teaching strategies for relaying the goals and the knowledge and the um, key student learning outcomes that you have for your students. So in this, um, on this slide, we have two pictures of teachers from the Raw Doll book, um, Matilda. One is Miss Honey, who is a very engaged, embodied, um, sensitive, uh, empathetic teacher um, who eventually becomes the character Matilda's guardian. And the other is her sister, Miss Trunchbull, who is a totalitarian, um abusive <laughs> powerful person in the school so it's kind of contrasting the different ways in which we teach and hopefully we don't really embody the trench bowl way of teaching because she's violent and abusive and like almost kills children in the story so that's not really a good way to go um so the purpose and element el elements of a teaching philosophy statement are professional, personal, pedagogical. So you use it as a professional document, but we're also relaying our personal beliefs and ideas about who we are as a um, professor and it really, or a teacher, and it really lays out what are our pedagogical roots? What are, what drives us as an educator? Um, we want to be clear and articulate with what we're talking about and how we're reflecting on that in a teaching philosophy statement. We want to have space for growth because teaching life learning is a ongoing process. We're already, we're always learning new ways to engage with students. Um, the hope is to always be on a journey as a teaching, as a teacher. Um, and we want to create structure and scaffolding through the examples that we relay in our teaching philosophy statements. We want to flesh out concepts and methods that we use to engage in learning and help our students and we want to have descriptions of how we are as a teacher and how we embody ourselves the goals we have for our students and for ourselves and how are we creating equitable space so not um not equal space but equitable so everybody is, ends up in the same space even if they need different assistance or um, adaptive tools to get there. And then what the last thing we want to include are what are new things that we're learning as an educator that are spurring our journey forward as an educator, or at least relay the fact that we are open to learning new things as an educator, even if we're just in that first phase of our first teaching assignment, it's really important to be some relaying the fact that you are open to learning new knowledge and new ways of doing things in the classroom. So we're going to watch this short video from the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and it kind of gives an overlay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Fernanda Zamudio Suarez, Breaking News Editor here at the Chronicle of Higher Education. And today I'm going to give you six tips to help you write a teaching philosophy. Okay, it's job search time. You've sent out your CV, you've lined up all of your letters of recommendation, but you still have to write a teaching philosophy. I know it's daunting, but don't worry, yours will be good. Now let's get started. Tip one, do a little research. Know a little bit about every different institution that you're applying to because you'll probably have to write many different teaching statements. Make sure to do research on every institution and its teaching culture. Tip two, begin at the end. What do you want your students to leave your course with? What are your teaching objectives? Tip three, don't make empty statements. Be specific. Lots of teaching statements start with sweeping philosophical declarations. The good ones anchor the general in something concrete, like an example that you can visualize. Tip four, who influenced you? Explain where you got your idea about pedagogy and why. Tip five, keep your statements short and well-written. Be yourself, just don't sound like a know-it-all. Tip six, it's about the student, stupid. If you're going to mention technology or teaching innovations, make sure that you talk about how the students reacted. Now, let's run the teaching philosophy. For more advice on the academic. 
So with that, we're going to take two minutes to um, kind of think about this question of what inspires or inspired your teaching philosophy statement. What are walking into it, even if you're totally green on this whole teaching philosophy statement idea, what are, um, what are some things that you already have in your head? Like, what are the key elements for you that you want to relay as an educator? So we're going to take two minutes and then we can come back and we'll chat a little bit if anybody wants to share, if feels comfortable sharing um, in response to this question. So we've got about a minute and a half left and then we'll come back. Okay, you've got about 30 more seconds. You should start to wrap up and we're gonna chat for just a second. Okay, so does anybody want to share either in chat or um, out loud anything that came up for you as you were thinking about this idea of teaching philosophy statements? Uh, I'll go. I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, well, I'll just start by introducing myself. Uh, hello, my name is Kelsey. I will be uh, a first year student uh, starting at CGU in the fall. Um, and this is actually my first uh, webinar. So uh, forgive me if I seem a little nervous. <laughs> um, but basically, <laughs> but basically, um, I, I want to help change a student's life for the better and perhaps help them find their purpose because that's what my professors in both my master's program and my bachelor's program did for me. Uh, I, do, I do believe that all students should experience a professor who helps them find their passion, whether it's 
you know, uh, overtly or covertly. And I feel as though a lot of my professors did that, whether or not I voiced it. Um, and because of how they taught and because they taught with passion, it led me to wanting to um, go for my PhD, but it also changed my life. I do believe that uh, education when done with the right intention can be transformative. Awesome, thank you for sharing. That's, that's part of the philosophy statement is who are those people who inspired you to move on um, and to become the person you're becoming as an educator and as, um, as a human. So thank you for sharing. Al, you, I see your hand raised. Do you have a comment? Hi, yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my name is Al. I'm in, uh, I'm in education, a PhD student in education, and I'm a fifth year. And um, I've always had issues with uh, delineating the difference between my philosophy of teaching statement and uh, my diversity statement. Is I, I've noticed that even when I'm free writing, it's like, oh, this really sounds like my philosophy of teaching statement. And then uh, when I work on a philosophy of teaching statement, I'm like, oh, this really sounds like my diversity statement. And so I'm curious as to... I don't want to repeat myself because a committee is going to read both. Right. And so it would look foolish of me to have, it's like almost like, you know, hey, please refer to paragraph three of my philosophy of teaching statement for the rest of this. So I'm, I'm always a little confused and I get stuck on, I mean, I don't know if you have to delineate between the two. I think the two are uh, connected. They're definitely connected, yeah. But I don't want to repeat myself. Sure. And so I'm having difficulty there. I, I don't know if you've got any uh, tips or tricks on on how to uh, decompress and um, write a thorough philosophy of teaching statement. That and, and my other question, I don't know if this is relevant. I'm sorry, I'm babbling, but uh, okay. just to throw it out, like um, how, how often should I reference philosophers? Oh, like, you don't like, have to reference philosophers. Like, like I don't have to, I don't have to reference Fred A or no. uh, George Counts or anybody who's had an impact on me. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, <clears throat> um, we're gonna go over that a little bit later. But really, unless you're doing your tenure track philosophy of teaching statement, you really want to keep it to one to two pages. So there's not a ton that you can do in one to two pages. I mean, you can relay some stuff, but. Um, you don't have to go back through and prove, you know, the history and philosophy of teaching. What you want to do is really highlight why you teach, how you teach, and um, what your intention is in teaching. Liz, would you agree with that? Yep, I completely agree with that. I think it's, it's definitely... Um, you know, depending on kind of where you are in, in your journey and what you want to elaborate on, it's, it, you definitely want to try to keep it concise to that two page count um, and really just emphasize and try to personalize it as much as you can based on, on, on who you are and kind of where you are in your journey. So to some extent, the, the, the distinction between the two is a diversity statement is looking at how do you support and encourage and create space for diversity in your in your teaching space carrie i see your hand um and versus your teaching philosophy statement which is really what does your unique imprint as an educator look like so your teaching philosophy statement should give some indication of who you are and how you function in the classroom and there is that similarity with the two but there's definitely the the teaching philosophy statement is more about you as an educator and how you support and encourage your students in that model versus the diversity, which is highlighting how do you make space for diversity? Would you, would you say that's a good distinction, Liz, between the two? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, what's your, Al, does that answer your questions? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Kiri. Um, my, I struggle a little because I am a, a PhD uh, fifth year working on my dissertation, but I've been teaching at a uh, law school because I'm an attorney uh, for 13 years. So my teaching philosophy 
I had the chance to teach a class at CGU, and so it's the same. Um, I am teaching fairly educated people, but even they struggle with not having confidence that they can do X, Y, or Z. And so I kind of felt my philosophy is about convincing them that they already have some skills to do something so that when they finish my class, they have more confidence to try it. So I do a lot of hands-on stuff. Say, okay, you do this, you know, you file this brief or you do whatever it is and trying to convince them they they know enough, they can do this. It, it's that whole, there's a lot of people with the imposter syndrome uh, in graduate schools. And so I try and make every class be, no, you're supposed to be here. You are right at the level you're supposed to be now. Show me, let's go. Uh, but I wonder, maybe it should be more educationally based um, because I don't, I have no teaching education classes. No, I think, I, I think you're relaying what works well in your field. And that's, that is a teaching philosophy. So it sounds like your teaching philosophy is a facilitation philosophy, a philosophy based on being a facilitator and allowing the students to have a safe space to play with the skill set that they would need in the classroom or in outside of the classroom in a space where they're going to get um, reflective feedback that it's okay for them to fail. So your teaching philosophy can be, I create, I facilitate a safe space for students to have the space to try and fail. That could be your teaching philosophy statement. Um, when I was an early childhood educator, that was my teaching philosophy statement, was creating a safe space for you know kids age zero to 14 to fail in a safe space. So that, because that's part of learning pedagogy is a journey. We don't ever enter in with all the knowledge we need at the get-go. And so we need safe spaces to be facilitated as a space for us to try and fail and learn from that and have that reflective feedback. Liz, would you agree that that's a good way to go? Yes, completely agree with you. Okay. Thank you both. Does that answer your question here? Yes. You rephrased it much better than I did. So thank you. That's what we're here for, to help do reflective listening with what we're hearing. York, what can we help you or add to the conversation? with? I raised my hand. I have a question. Sure. Because at the very beginning, it said that we may have to write several philosophy statements. Sure. Uh, sure depending on where you're going to be applying to. Now, I am wondering, because if you're applying to a conservative school or if you're applying to a religious school sure. or any other type of um, school that may have a, a difference, uh, isn't your philosophy statement still going to be the same, primarily because you don't, you don't want to misrepresent yourself? If you're not a religious person, I mean, maybe the philosophy statement would be your philosophy statement, and then you decide to apply to a religious or a conservative school based on what you, your own beliefs are, rather than changing your philosophy statement. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is, wouldn't your philosophy be the same across the board? And yes, to some extent, your philosophy is gonna be the same across the board, um, but like any other materials that you're putting together for a job interview process, right? You're gonna highlight certain things for certain organizations and kind of not necessarily highlight other things because you wanna match and connect with what are the core values of that space that you're entering into. So for a diversity statement or a teaching philosophy statement at a conservative religious school that does not support, um, I don't know, I guess LGBTQT is probably the QIA, groups is probably the best example of this, as unfortunate as that is, then you probably, if you have a strong background working with LGBTQT students, you might not want to have that highlighted in your teaching, as one of your examples in your teaching philosophy statement, because for some of those very conservative universities, that's not going to be a value that they want to see in their potential employees. Does that make sense? Liz, does that feel like a good, I know that's a weird example, but with the current political climate, that's definitely an example that I've seen. Um, 
does that feel like a good explanation? Does that make sense as an explanation of how you might navigate that distinction? Yeah, I understand. That's, yeah, that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm wondering from others if, if that if that's resonating and making sense to you all. Does anybody else have thoughts on that? I mean, I would also, my gut would also be as an educator, I understand we need jobs, right? And jobs are few and far between depending on your field. Um, I definitely have at least one friend who's an artist who works at a very conservative school and is not very conservative. Um, but I would also, if you have the capacity to apply more towards programs and schools that align more deeply with your ethics and philosophy um, for beliefs, that would be something I would also say as you're thinking through your teaching philosophy statement and any other documents that you're putting together for job applications. Um, I'm a religious studies major. I do not apply to conservative schools because I know the way I teach and how I teach is not valued there. So that's one of the questions as you think about moving forward, specifically as you're looking at your teaching philosophy statement, I, I don't apply to schools that don't, um, that I can't teach how I teach. Um, does that make sense? Casey. So it, so it sounds like basically researching an institution is definitely key. Like yes. that should be almost bolded because you don't want your teaching philosophy or even your personal philosophy to go against the institution because obviously it, it's almost as if that's very stifling and oppressive because you can't teach or flourish in a way that you want to or touch your students how you would want to. Definitely. And I think part of that is a personal, a personal choice too. Some people... Um, my spouse is also an educator. Um, they are also very um, able to navigate with um, finesse, complicated relational dynamics and belief dynamics. I am not. And so for him, he chooses, he can work in spaces that have more areas of difference from his own beliefs because his teaching philosophy is rooted in something different and the way he teaches is rooted in something different than mine. And mine, me personally, I teach out of a lot of LGBTQT scholarship and feminist scholarship. And so that's not going to work in certain conservative institutions because it's not valued. So does that, does that answer that question broadly? And this is something that we can, you can always make an appointment with one of us and talk further on if you have more questions about. Um, for the sake of time, as long as nobody else has any questions, I wanna move us along so we keep getting the information on um, the teaching philosophy statement. Does that sound good with everybody? All hearts clear? Cool, okay. So give me just one second and I'll pull up our next slide. Okay, so some of the general guidelines that we have on our teaching philosophy statement is having it brief and well-written. So as I said a little bit earlier, unless you're doing your tenure track level um, teaching philosophy statement, which tends to run three to five pages, you really wanna keep it down to that one to two page um, timeframe. And you, you also want it to be first person narrative. So this is you telling your story about who you are as an educator and how, what you do and what that looks like. Um, as we said, saw in the video and as we said earlier, we really want it to be connected to specifics. So much like when you write student learning outcomes, you want this one-to-one. -one. This, is, this is the philosophical and this is what it looks like in the practical. And, and we want it to be focused on your specific skill set, your discipline, your research interests, because that's one of the things that they're, they're hiring you for is, is your own unique um, research and approach to subjects. So we also want to avoid 
super jargony or um, technical terms because that can inhibit people who are reading them, especially if you're taking your philosophy statement into spaces where not everybody's um, keyed into certain field or um, research topic specific words. You also don't wanna simply repeat your CV. You want this document to flesh out your CV. Um, you also want it to have that unique fingerprint of who you are. So you don't wanna copy somebody else's teaching philosophy statement. Um, you can use it as a template for how to construct it, but you really wanna highlight your own, self, your own ideas and your own way of being. Um, you want to be humble, but also highlight what you do and how you do with your students and how that works. And it's going to be an ongoing process. The, the more you're in a teaching space, whether it's academic, academic adjacent, or outside of academia, you're ever changing depending on your students and what you're teaching and how you're teaching. So you want to keep that reflective revising modality in your teaching philosophy statement in the same way you would do with your resume or a cover letter or any other documents like that. So these are the basic do's and don'ts. <coughs> Excuse me. They come from Cornell University. They're kind of hitting on what we just talked about. You don't want to give empty concepts. You don't want to repeat your CV. You want to do the research, as we talked about, on the different institutions, <coughs> excuse me, and um, structures and modalities and organizations you're working with. You don't want to send a conservative school your application for a liberal school. That's not going to get you the job or vice versa. Um, you want to keep it short. You want to provide solid examples. Um, and you want to ask questions or talk about the impacts of the types of methodology that you use, the way you teach your lessons, the challenges that you've had with um, being adaptive. Because one of our big things as an educator is being able to pivot and be adaptive when things come up in the classroom. Um, and how have you innovated learning for your students? And then you want to discuss your connections between your teaching and your research and all the things you're doing that flesh you out as an educator. So we're going to take another minute and a half um, to reflect on what are some of the guidelines that are sticking out to you just based on what we've, we've kind of gone over briefly in the last few minutes. What of those seems manageable? Like, I can definitely make this not my CV or um, you know, I, I know who has inspired me. And then what feels challenging? Like, is the practical challenging? You know, is the um, honing down on what your unique fingerprint feel challenging? So take two minutes and reflect on, or a minute and a half and reflect on that. And then we'll come back and just do a really brief conversation. We have about 30 more seconds to reflect. conversation if anybody has any questions.
So does anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything they want to share about that reflective question in regard to the teaching philosophy statement? If not, we can just keep moving on. Okay, I'll go again real quick. <laughs> um, uh, doing the research and tailoring my statements to fit that specific institution seemed like the most uh, manageable. Um, and then to me, the most challenging might be not to sound too repetitive between my statements and my CV. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what my reflection. <laughs> Absolutely. That's definitely something that we at PFF can help you with. We do reviews for teaching philosophy statements. Um, so that was something that you could schedule an appointment with us and be like, I feel like I'm just overstating the same thing. Can you help me work that out? So yeah, thank you for sharing. Barbara, you have a question or your hand raised? Yes. Um, one of the things that um, was on there was using specific examples. Now, I have not taught um, other than training, um, you know, new trainees where I work at as a bank, like a new employee that just got promoted or whatever and has not ever done analysis before so that is what i've done but would you use that as an example if you absolutely would? okay so that can be an example um of how you teach because you're you're still teaching okay. also um i think almost every class at cgu has students do student presentations that is also a space where you're teaching, you're teaching your class, you're relaying information. So that also counts as teaching. Um, there are also occasional opportunities to teach um, through different scholarships or fellowships at CGU. Um, and anything that you're doing teaching, I think until you're getting in the specific types of classrooms that you're wanting to work with are things that you know, if you're giving lectures, if you're leading a small group at a religious institution or a group that you're involved with, those are also places where you're teaching and you're going to, you may use different strategies in different spaces, but who you are as an embodied educator, I think tends to carry through different settings. Would you agree with that statement, Liz? Yes. yes. Is there anything you would add in regard to thinking about teaching background? No, I think um, I think it, it it's definitely what you've shared. Um, I think it it you know regardless of whether you have direct experience in teaching or if you have just lived experience in being able to help individuals learn, I think the the way that you kind of present it and the 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 opportunities and the way that you facilitate learning can be described in a lot of different ways. So you could either, if you don't have direct teaching experience and you're looking to teach, you can still speak to how you've approached learning and being able to be an adaptable, inclusive um, in, in, individual in different settings. So if it's a, in a work environment, um, if it's as a student and you know, like, like uh, Jesse shared in doing student presentations, um, you can really demonstrate those uh, skill sets outside of a, a, a structured kind of classroom environment. Yeah. Thank sense. you. Does anybody else have any questions or are we good to move on? And know that you, if you have questions later on, you can always schedule appointments with us through PFF and we're more than willing to talk through your unique situation with you. So we get to move on? All hearts clear? Okay, awesome. Let me pull up the slide, our next slide. So we're almost done, we're pretty close. Okay, so the next question is, how do I use this? What is this for? Um, so we definitely use this when applying for jobs. Um, you can use it in the classroom or as supporting documents um, for thinking about how you're going to teach, especially if you're new to your subject area or transitioning between stuff. Rethinking about how you engage is good. Um, you want to continue to reflect and revise, as we said. You can also include 
sections of your teaching philosophy statement on a bio for um, anything that you're presenting, or I have mine on my scholar website, which also is my website for um, public speaking and um, public scholarship. And so that's another thing, space where you could use it to help people kind of see who you are and how you are. Um, anytime really you need to or want to explain who you are, how you are, and what your unique fingerprint as an educator, as a facilitator looks like, this can be used, whether you're a short form or long form of your teaching philosophy statement. Um, you can also use it for the first day of class with your students to help them understand how you're going to approach teaching them and what does it look like. And why do you teach the way you do? Why do you use ungrading? Why is that so important to you? Or why do you use rubrics in a certain way? All of that, that's a great thing. Um, if you're teaching outside of academia, you can use it at the beginning of the lecture or workshop to explain your methodology. So we're into our last reflection. So we're gonna take two minutes and think about what are some of the things that as we're talking come up for you as unique perspectives or experiences that you have that really highlight your unique fingerprint as an educator in a space. It could be, you know, I am a first generation student. Um, nobody in my family has gone on to college or graduate school. Um, it can be, I, you know, lost a parent early on in life. And so that codes how I see things. Um, you know, one of mine is I am neurodiverse, so that always codes how I think about and walk into any educational setting because of my own need for adaptive modality. So take a minute or two, think about what might you bring uniquely as a educator in your own spaces. Sound good? And then we'll come back and we'll chat and then we'll wrap up. about 20 more seconds and then we're going to come back and talk. Okay, I think the music is a little loud. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where to put it. <laughs> <laughs> we're always learning here at BFF, just like we <laughs> Tell everybody to. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna come back and um,
Okay, now my computer's waking up. There we go. Okay. Um, so, does anybody want to share kind of what they were reflecting on or anything that kind of came to mind as, as safe as you feel or not feel? Feel free to share. Um, things that you think might come into play for you that help with your unique fingerprint as an educator. Yeah, Greg. Uh, this is Jorge Lambrinos. I, I've been teaching for quite a while. I have different types of experiences in teaching. I started out originally uh, teaching in high school, and mm -hmm. then I went on to work in the federal government. And I spent most of my career in the federal government developing and implementing policy, especially aging policy. Mm -hmm. When I left the federal government, I started teaching aging policy. And what I have done is that I've used the experience that I gather throughout my career and use those real life examples when it comes to the, discussing a particular topic. And I find that very effective because the students seem to relate to it because it's real life. What I've run into problems is when the university then says, no, I need to stick to the textbook because apparently they want to use the, the exams or the tests that have been developed based on the textbook rather than what I'm teaching them from real life experience. So that's created some problems for me at times. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge when you're, you're that's one of the challenges that we face, right, as educators sometimes is having a university standard that they're wanting you to meet. Um, but also you're finding that the way in which you engage with your students is actually more effective. Um, so one of the things that I might suggest is trying to find a balance between utilizing your effective real life scenarios while still highlighting the core things that the university you're at, at is wanting to be relayed. Because sometimes we are stuck in those, those we have to hit certain points with, with a given university. Does that does that make sense or help at all? Yeah, it makes sense, and I, that's what I try to do. I, I look at the syllabus, and then I see what we're going to be discussing for that particular lecture, and then that's when I bring in the real life experiences and real life uh, actions that actually happen concerning that particular topic, or how do you process that particular policy, how you develop that policy. Yeah. So, but somehow um, there's this conflict here that uh, stick to the textbook. So anyway, yeah. but I've managed. So we've been, I've been very successful. So having it very much problems with it, but I've found that as a conflict at times. Yeah, that's definitely a conflict you can run into at certain institutions when they're definitely, when they're <laughs> wanting everybody to fit in a certain parameter with what they're teaching. But it sounds like you're you're navigating it in the way that we would recommend navigating it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Heidi. So this may get a little personal, but I guess I had some sexual trauma when I was in high school. And so I feel like I could bring that. Um, however, how do you say that you are interested in trauma-informed education and that's really important to you without necessarily disclosing, sorry, I didn't mean to turn that off, without really necessarily disclosing too much about sensitive topics? Yeah, I mean, I think what you just said, saying, you know, saying you could couch it with, um, I am very interested in trauma-informed um, and trauma-attuned, um, sorry, words are hard sometimes, I'm trying to think of the right word for that, but trauma-informed educating because of personal history. And that's that's all you have to say. Like, the, the, unless you have a space where it feels safer to disclose the specifics, um, you know, Personal history could be somebody next to you who you care about. It can be yourself. Um, and trauma-informed modalities are really something that certain institutions are wanting. 
you know, depending on where you are, um, especially in that academic adjacent or academic um, aligned spaces, um, I, I'm, I engage with and follow a lot of activists. And that's a big thing that I'm seeing in like therapy and other activist spaces that are educational is being aware, trauma-informed. Um, so that's definitely something that I would put in my teaching philosophy statement, that trauma-informed educating, trauma-informed environments is something that I personally bring to the table when I'm teaching. Yeah, great, great question. No. Does that, does that help? Do you have any other questions? That was it. Cool. Not to put you on the spot. I was just making sure you had the space. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they want to bring up that they were reflecting on? If not, we're cool. We're almost done anyways. So we can wrap up. Yeah, this is Jorge again. I was wondering, is there a, a sample uh, statement that you might be able to make available that you feel is a good one? So in the, um, in the notes document that I will reshare right now, um, let me find it. Um, I have uh, several of the websites that I use to create this webinar. Also PFF specific questions for developing your teaching philosophy statement and um, links to a couple other resources. So in that, there are resources for teaching philosophy statements and um, how to write a good one. Where is that? Is that on the, uh, on the if chat? You go, yeah, if you go to the chat, um, it says notes for teaching philosophy and download that. That's a Word document that you can write in, reflect in, and use the resources within that. Yeah, what I'm getting is a whole, a whole bunch of uh, folders. Is that the right thing? No, it should just be um, a Word document. No, it's just uh, I have a listing of about maybe 15, 20, maybe 30 fo individual folders. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Um, well, I will, I will get your email and I will send that to you as a Word document. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah. I think, I, I think what happens is you have to actually save it. So once you um, once you'll see like a little pop-up window and you can save the file like to your desktop or to whatever folder you store files to, and then you should be able to open it. But yeah, I, I think I, I, I know what you're seeing because it's a, like a little pop-up window that has like the different uh, folders that you could save it to. Um, so I would suggest trying to save it, but I, but it sounds like Jesse can also just email it to you. Yeah, that'd be a lot easier because I'll probably get confused with this stuff here. Yeah. Problem. It's also, um, if you go to the page where you sign up for the PFF webinar, um, it's also there when you download the slides, it should be with the slides. Um, I think our, our admin added it to the slides, but we will make sure you get that. I appreciate it. I'm a carbon paper guy, so. No, no, no. I'm a computer it. guy. Thank you. <laughs> totally. Um, does anybody else have any questions or have trouble getting that document? Yep, all good? Okay. So that concludes our, um, our webinar. Thank you for participating. We have a poll that we're gonna um, launch right now. If you would fill that out for us, that would be amazing. And then in the chat, um, we're also going to put the way in which the various ways in which you can connect with PFF. Um, let me pull that up right now and I'll throw that in the chat. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can connect with us. Um, as I said, you can make appointments with any of us. You could take the teaching, um, college teaching um, certificate program that we offer that goes along with any CGU um, degree. And then these are the other ways that you can connect with us. So thank you so much for coming and participating um, and having such robust, awesome questions. Um, and we have one more webinar for our summer series, which is 
next Tuesday from noon to one. Is it noon to one? I think it's noon to one. Um, and Liz and I will be doing that again next week. So if you're free Tuesday, August 2nd from noon to one, and you want to talk about student learning objectives, feel free to join us <laughs> for lunch. Um, so we're going to give one more minute for the poll and then we're going to close it out. If you have filled out the poll and have everything else that you need, you are free to go. Thank you for joining us.